Amen. Well, good morning, Discovery Church. Okay, good morning, 1030 crowd. What's cracking? Man, what a, what a week. You guys, have you ever just had that, like, what a week? Um, man, I've been dealing with, with this funk. Uh, started in here last Sunday. That's why I didn't stick around that, that long at our, uh, at our celebration. Uh, but I moved in here. Which, by the way, can we just, man, seven baptisms last Sunday? Dude, can we give it up for that? It's crazy. Crazy. And uh, old Cameron came, uh, came out of nowhere. This, this young gentleman was just in the water. We're baptizing. He's like, hey, can I be baptized? And Tim's like, uh, sure, go talk to her. And uh, he pointed to Teresa. And Teresa walked over there, uh, introduced herself to his family and uh, talked with them, asked him the questions, all the answers hit the mark. And uh, we said, hey, let's baptize. And so uh, it actually turned out that he was actually a former student of uh, one of our teachers, Mr. Donald, Mr. Logue over there. And uh, a couple people actually knew him. And so uh, very encouraging. And the young man, I, I, I am uh, encouraged to tell you, he is a part of the first priority club that meets there on campus at LPA. And so he is getting discipled. That's always one of my, my biggest things is, is, is after people make that next step, what's, what's next, right? Like, let's get them discipled. And so uh, that's awesome, man. That, that's good stuff that that gets to happen and that we get to be a part of that. Uh, so today, we start part one of the best sermon ever, uh, right? No pressure. No pressure. Best sermon ever. It's like I'm supposed to come up here and kick off. The best sermon ever after, you know, uh, following Pastor Tim and his faithfulness and uh, his passion. And um, speaking of Pastor Tim, he is okay for some of you guys that have been asking. Uh, he is probably safer than we are right now. Israel is one of the most safest places in the world. Um, the Iron Dome is insane and it's multiple and they're driving around and uh, they shot down 99% of those, uh, those missiles and um, the only casualty I believe Tim said was this little girl, she got injured, um, but she's okay. Business as usual back in Israel. So, uh, you know, feel free, keep praying for him. Um, we're praying for, you know, safe travel as he comes home. We want to know what that looks like with the airlines opening up, but we, uh, we're, we're, our faith is in Jesus. Amen. And uh, if, if Pastor Tim, God forbid, doesn't make it back, we will not have church next Sunday. Because um, there's no way I want to do what he does. Um, I'm okay. I told the nine, nine o'clock, I'm okay being like the, the number two guy. Or the number three. Or the number five. I'll be number 59. I don't care. Uh, I'm more of a, hey, let me help you hold this staff. Instead of here, hold the staff. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm a great wingman. Um, I just, I, this week dealing with this, this sickness, like it was bedridden, deliberating and having to lead, not just the student ministry, the kids ministry, but the rest of this church. Um, <laughs> let me tell you what, uh, pray for pastor Tim. Cause I don't know how he does it. He, he not only leads this church, but he is also in, 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 I guess, responsible for 66 other pastors within our Treasure Coast Baptist Association. So different, 66 different churches who he encourages their pastor and pours into them. So he's not just pouring in here, he's pouring in there and then at home. And, uh, you know, I, I acknowledged, uh, them at the, the first service, but I want to acknowledge him again. Um, be praying for, for, for Audra and the girls and them as a family, because let me tell you, there's a lot of sacrifices that, that goes through that family that Pastor Tim will never tell you about. Um, and he does it for you, to meet you where you're at. Um, after hours, so many, so many times. And he doesn't tell you because he doesn't want you to feel like it's a burden. Um, as a pastor, that's what his role is. As the lead pastor, that's what his role is. And he gladly does it. But I'll tell you, there is a cost. And there is time that's missed. And so when he's meeting with you, know that it's because he cares about you and uh, he really does want to see you become a fully devoted follower of Jesus. It's kind of an awesome treat to have Corey up here. I served with Corey uh, when I first came to Discovery. Corey was, um, was on staff as well, not on staff, volunteer, but he was a worship leader and uh, joined in the student ministry with him. 
Uh, if it wasn't for him, I would have probably been fired like 15 times uh, early on because, you know, six months into giving my life to Christ, I'm leading a student ministry. I did not like student ministries. Like when I was 15, they were the reason these, these, these jerks, if you will, they were the reason that I wanted nothing to do with Jesus, right? We talk about salt and light. They were salty, not salt. Okay. It, it was a turnoff and it took till I was 30 years old to see that light in somebody to finally realize that that's what it is to be a follower of Jesus. And so, uh, man, I was just so, so blessed to serve alongside of him for so many years and, uh, have him as, as a mentor, if you will, even though he's younger than me, uh, when it comes to in the faith, that doesn't matter. Okay. It doesn't matter because I'm looking around and I see some 60 year, your 60 year olds that are still sucking on a bottle in here. So it doesn't matter the age, right? Shots fired. It's going to get real today. Don't worry. Um, but here's the deal. Here's the deal. I was so blessed to have somebody who was a little further than me showing me what it looked like to walk with the Lord. And he took the time and he truly was a light. And so my prayer is that, that when we leave here today, we have a better understanding of what that looks like and what that can be. So, um, you heard pastor Tim read our, our, our verses today. We are in, um, we just finished the Beatitudes up. So where pastor Tim was standing as the, where Jesus would have given his message, he would have been looking out at the sea of Galilee with everybody looking up at him. The reason he chose that spot is because of the acoustics. And so it carried his voice. So as he spoke, his voice carried and he was able to address the crowds, right? And at this time there was a whole mass of people following him and they weren't following him just because he was Jesus. They wanted to see signs and wonders and the miracles and they wanted him for his stuff. Kind of like how it is today. Uh, a lot of people want God for what he can do for them. And that's it. Um, and, and so Jesus says, Hey, check this out. I'm about to thin the herd a little bit and I'm about to preach this message. Now, as he was preaching to the crowd and here's the deal, it was mainly for his disciples is who he was really preaching to. Um, because as we'll see later on in the next couple of weeks, the crowd started to thin out when Jesus started to challenge them and said, Hey, this is what it really looks like. And the crowd started to thin. Why? Because they were there for selfish motives. And so we start off today. I'm going to reread the scripture. Then we'll pray and then we'll jump in. We start off today in Matthew 5, 13 through 16. And it says this, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt should lose its taste, how can it be made salty? It's no longer good for anything, but to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world, a city situated on a hill that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather a lamp on a lampstand. And it gives light for all who are in the house. Verse 16 says, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your father in heaven. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for this word. Thank you for God. Thank you for, for loving us. God, thank you for the, the instruction that your word brings and that the Holy Spirit provides. And Father, I just pray that everything that comes out of my mouth glorifies you, points to you. It's all about you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So what does it mean to be the salt of the earth? We hear this, right? By the way, anybody like salt in here? Who's a salt fan? Woo, right? My favorite chip, salt and vinegar. Okay, uh, anything that has to do with salt. I love salt, but here's the deal. Too much salt can be a little bad, right? Uh, my wife, I joke with her all the time. You know, I, I say, you know, probably gonna, probably gonna die of high blood pressure because of all the salt. And she's like, that's horrible. You can change that. I said, yeah, but then I'd be miserable. I love salt. Um, and guess what? I know where I'm going. <laughs> I know where I'm going. Uh, and, and so for me, uh, man, this be the salt. Like I understand what it means to be salt, what it means to, to love salt and have salt. The Cambridge dictionary, this is what it actually says. The Cambridge dictionary. Uh, so a worldly dictionary says to be the salt of the earth means to be very good, honest, and reasonable and not thinking of yourselves special in any way. 
See, Jesus chose salt because it was one of the things that everybody could identify with. Followers of Jesus, uh, we are like salt. Although we're ordinary and uh, everywhere, and we get involved in pretty much everything, whether we noticed or not, we also have a variety of roles to play as God's kingdom comes on earth. Salt has, has so many different uses. Uh, one of the most common uses was for flavoring, right? We talked about that. Salt makes food taste better, either by adding flavor to something that would otherwise be bland. Who likes French fries with no salt? That's right. Amen. Awesome. Who likes potato chips with no salt? Right? I mean, this, it, just, it just helps. It improves, right? Uh, or it enhances flavors that are already there, right? Like vegetables. I'm not a vegetable, right? I, I, I'm not a vegetable. I don't like vegetables. I'm not a vegetable either. I mean, that's a true statement. But I don't like vegetables. But let me tell you what. You put those bad boys in the oven with a little olive oil and some salt, I will eat some Brussels sprouts that way. You know what I'm saying? Right? House might smell like a fart, but I will eat some Brussels sprouts. Right? It's amazing what salt does. But then... There's a contrast that salt also helps out with, with the sweet, right? How many of you guys are salted caramel fans? Woo, come on, somebody. You can tell I like me some salted caramel, right? We're intended to spread throughout the world and enhance it by adding flavor to things that would be bland, drawing out the blessings of whatever is good and providing a contrast by being distinct and different. So Colossians chapter four, verse six says this, let your speech always be gracious and seasoned with no pepper. Uh, no, it says salt. I'm just kidding. Pepper is horrible. Seasoned with salt so that you may know how you should answer each person. So not only does salt enhance, but salt also preserves. Um, salt was an ancient equivalent of the refrigeration system back in the day. If you wanted to stop meat or fish from decaying, you would rub salt in it and make it edible for longer. This was the main reason salt was so valuable. Matter of fact, Roman soldiers were also sometimes paid in salt. It was called a salary. That's actually where the word salary comes from was a Roman's wages in salt. Um, as disciples of Jesus, in this sense, we are sent into the world to keep it from decay, preserving it, its goodness and preventing it from becoming corrupt or ruined, which is a helpful thing to bear in mind as we go to work every day. I think that's pretty self-explanatory when it talks about being salt. All of us have had way too much salt. Uh, we were doing a small group one time, and I was making chili, and my chili is on, the, on point. Like I think it was white chicken chili, and I make a mean chili. But uh, as we were eating it, everybody's like this. And I'm like, what's going on? They're like, dude, this is too salty. I'm like, no, it's not. And I ate it. I'm like, oh, that's horrible. What is wrong, right? Well, what I didn't tell them is when I was making it, I went to go pour the salt in there and the, the lid came off and half of the salt container went in there. Like, and I'm trying to like, I'm trying my best to scoop it all out. I'm like, oh, oh gosh, oh gosh, right, right. And it didn't work. And uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was not good. And guess what? Nobody ate it. We threw it out. And it ruined the food. And I felt bad because I had to hear about it. Uh, as as we, we do in, in most of our small groups, we like to pick on each other uh, out of fun. And I had to hear about it every time we had chili afterwards. Oh, is Mike making it? It's going to be like his chicken legs. Right? It was too much. Fam, sometimes we can be too salty. Amen? Does it, you, you agree with that? Sometimes we put a little too much on it. And... As I was looking for some shirts, like you see the shirt I have on today, it says be um, not just a salt shaker and a light, a light bulb. Don't be that, be salt and light. Um, but be salt and light, not salty and lit. So I was gonna get this shirt Sunday Cool makes it. It says salt, salty and lit. And I'm like, oh, that's awesome, right? And then I got to thinking, to be salty and lit is the opposite of what we're called to be, right? Because last I checked, to be salty means you're ornery. And to be lit, well, we all know what it means to be lit, right? And last I checked, we're called to be sober-minded, not lit. So instead of being salty and lit, let's be salt and light. Because salt doesn't just flavor, salt saves. 
Amen? It's not just for flavoring, it's for preserving. So that's where we're at on salt. The second statement, Jesus calls us to be the light of the world. And so what does that mean? What does it mean to be the light of the world? Well, that means we are called to literally be the bright spot in this dark, dark world. We're not called to be like the rest of the world. God created this world and it was good and we messed it up. The reason this world is so dark is because of our sinfulness. Sin is a selfish, inherited nature. We've done this. The reason death rates are up, the reason people have more cancer, more diseases, more intolerance to gluten and all this stuff that never really existed is because of us. It's because of the stuff that we've put into this planet. We took this beautiful planet and we polluted it. And what are we called to do? We're called to preserve it, to enhance it. And instead we said, hey, no, God, I got a better idea. Check this out. Let me tell you what, your plans are nothing considered God's plans. All right. Our plans are good. And most of the time, man, they're on point. But our plans are just that, our plans. We're called to have his plans. And so we mess this place up. And this place is a dark, dark place. And can I say this? The answer is for some, and I've heard this, well, I know where I'm going. I know where I'm going when I die. Who cares about the rest of the world? Let them burn. If that's you and you have that mentality, can I tell you right now, you're wrong and you need to be rebuked. And if you're sitting in here today, I pray that God convicts you like no other before. That mentality of let the world burn, I know where I'm going. Dude, do you not realize where you were at when God met you? Do you not realize the darkness that you were in when somebody decided to be that light to you? And for us to have that selfish mentality of forget this world, screw it, it's all, it's all going to hell anyways, right? That's a worse mentality to have. Because I guarantee you what? If we saw a little kid jump out there in the middle of the road, would we just be like, oh, little kid's going to get hit. Watch him. Watch him. Boom. Done. No, we would be jumping in the road, saving the little dude out of the road so he didn't get hit. Right? But here's the deal. Every day, every day, we pass people on the streets. We pass people that we work with. We pass people that we live with. And we don't care. Because if we cared, we'd share. Right? Sharing is caring. But for some of us, we have these excuses. We come up with all these excuses on why we can't share our faith. Maybe it's because we're scared. That's one of the most common. Well, I, I'm scared. I'm scared. I'm scared to get uh, persecuted. I'm scared of what somebody's going to do. Did we not read last week? Blessed are those who are persecuted. For me. Right? When you're out sharing your faith, who cares what comes against you? Blessed are you in those times. There's countries right now that you can't mention the name of Jesus without being arrested and possibly murdered. Jesus, Yahweh, can't even mention it. And we're scared of what people are going to think. You know why we're scared of what people are going to think? Because we have a fear of man rather than fear of the Lord. We're scared of what our neighbor is going to think about us rather than what God has called us to. Church, do not be scared. Be strong. Be courageous. Every one of the apostles that was in that upper room 51 days later when Pentecost happened and the Holy Spirit came upon them, every one of them discipled. They walked out of that room bold. And guess what? It wasn't just like they were walking into the streets and there was a whole parade and everybody loved Jesus. They were looking for people who were talking about Jesus. They were, they, were, they were persecuting them. They were putting them to death. And these guys walked out of there and said, hey, we got this. Why? Because we've been given the Holy Spirit. We've been given the comforter. We've been given the guide. And that's who we're going to be. That's who we're going to follow. That's who we're going to be led by. You walk out of there by yourself, of course you're going to be scared. You ever wonder how like, you go somewhere, it's easier when you have a buddy with you. You feel more comfortable when you have a buddy with you going somewhere, especially somewhere new versus by yourself. But a lot of us stifle the Holy Spirit. We're scared. We have excuses. 
Maybe we don't feel worthy. Can I tell you, church? I still don't feel worthy. I don't feel worthy to be up here in front of you bringing you this word. I don't. But it's not about what I feel. I'm not ruled by feelings and emotions. Because you know know what? My identity is not found in me. My identity is found in Christ and who Christ sees me as. And he calls me beloved. He calls me by name. The same creator that knows every, every grain of sand in the Sahara Desert knows me by name, knows you by name. You're worthy. You are worthy because he made you worthy. Third thing, maybe we don't know what to say and we don't want to mess it up. You want to know why you don't know what to say? It's because you haven't spent enough time with the master. You haven't spent enough time with the father. He will show you what to say. He will guide you what to say. He will bring people in your path who need to hear this message. I don't know what to say most times either. So you know what I tell him? Man, Jesus loves you. God loves you. He has a plan for you. And his plan is not for you to spend eternity separated from him. It's not hard to share the gospel. But for some reason, we have a hard time doing it. Where you're sitting at right now, I want you to think, when's the last time you shared your faith with somebody? And I don't say that to, to condemn you. I say that at a leading of the Holy Spirit to to hopefully usher in some conviction. When was the last time you shared your faith with somebody? Because there's there's a huge line of people steady going to hell. Steady spending eternity separated from the Father. Why? Because someone was scared. Because someone didn't know what to say. Ask him. Scripture says, if you need wisdom, ask. All you do is simply ask. But here's the deal. Prayer is the last resort instead of the first priority. So no, matter, no wonder we don't know what to say. We're relying on our own power, on our own leading, instead of the leading of the Holy Spirit. Here's what I think it really is. I think it's spiritual immaturity. That's what I think it is. I think what happens is we have an amazing experience with the Lord. We give our lives to Christ. We get baptized. And then we come in here Sunday after Sunday and just sit and consume and suck up air and take a spot and never take a next step. We become these fat, bloated Christians, never giving, always getting We as Americans have treated this church like a prostitute. What can I get out of it? Let me tell you what. The church is not a prostitute. The church is the bride of Christ. Look around. Look around. This is the church. We are the church. We are not called to simply stand by and sit and be passively content and comfortable in our seats. This is where we come to be encouraged, to be equipped, to go out and to share our faith. This is where we come to learn how to feed ourselves, not constantly get fed by the pastor. Because here's what that looks like. If, I, if, if my son, who is about to turn 11, who just turned 11, sorry, if my son is 11, is, is in here, and I'm sitting here holding him in my arms, feeding him with a bottle, how weird does that look? So then why is it acceptable for us to come in here Sunday after Sunday with our mouths open expecting Pastor Tim to baby bird us? That's what we're expecting. No, no, I don't even want to chew it, Pastor Tim. Chew it up for me and spit it in my mouth. Right? That's what we do. Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, we come in here, we hear a great message, and we bob our heads like, yeah, that was good. And then we walk out these doors and we forget everything that we had just heard. And we go back to living our selfish lives. Let me tell you what. Our lives are not ours. Our lives are his. We were bought with a ransom. If you lose your life for the sake of the gospel, it is not your life to lose. Yeah, you're weak. Guess what? It's in our weakness that he's made strong. Amen? I'm so tired 
of seeing the world act like better Christians than the church. I'm so tired of people knowing what the church stands against than rather what the church stands for. We have become complacent. We have become lukewarm. And no wonder God took his hand off the United States. No wonder he removed his lampstand. Because let me tell you, church, we got a lot of ground to make up. This is a dark, dark, dark world. But can I encourage you with this? Because it's so dark, your light gets to shine brighter. Your light gets to be magnified. And it's because of him, not because of you, not because of me, but because of him. And so what are we going to do? Are we going to stay content? Are we going to stay comfortable in our own little pod? Ready for Pastor Tim to chew up another steak and spit it in our mouths? Or are we finally going to pick up some, a fork and a knife and start cutting our own meat? Start feeding our own selves. Because let me tell you what, if the only time you ever eat is on Sunday morning, you are hungry the rest of the week. And matter of fact, you ain't just hungry, you're hangry. And that's the reason nobody wants to come to your church is because you don't look like a Christ follower during the week because you eat one time on a Sunday morning. How dare we ask God to show up in our lives when we don't show up where he's at? But God, his grace is sufficient. It's his love. It's not Pastor Mike's measuring stick. It's God's. And let me tell you what. He loves each and every one of us. And he has a plan. And his plan is not for us to sit comfortably in these blue, gray, black, tan seats. But to get off of our butts, leave these four walls, and to lead people to be fully devoted followers of Jesus, preaching the gospel everywhere we go, not just here, but to the ends of the earth. Jesus says, love God with everything you have, and then love your neighbor. You want to know why the reason we don't share the gospel with our neighbor? Because we don't love him. It's because we don't love God with everything we have. We've never experienced it yet. We, we've gotten a little taste for some of us. For the rest of us, we've experienced it and we've gone stale. We've become lukewarm. And Jesus says, I will spit you out of my mouth for you are neither hot nor cold. It's time to wake up, church. It's time to take the basket off of your lamp. It's time to be the lighthouse to all those ships out in the harbor that are about to wreck. Turn the light on. Be the light. Be the salt. Be an encouragement. Use your words to build up, not to break down. Church, you want your friends and family to know Jesus? Show them what he looks like. God is using every, every one of us. He wants to use every one of us to share his word. Don't you think God could appear right here, to, right now, today, and everyone would believe because they saw but what did he say? Faith is believing without seeing. But let me encourage you with this. Every time that you choose to let your light shine, you are showing. You are showing Jesus in flesh. All authority has been given to him. And don't you know he said, hey, and as my representatives on this planet, as my people, don't you think I want you to do that? Can I encourage you to wake up? It's time to wake up. We've been asleep for far too long, church. People need to see that there is love found in the Lord. Not wrath. Love. God never sent not one person to hell. He gave us the opportunity to choose. And for a lot of us, we don't care what our family and friends choose. Because if we did, we'd be more vocal. And so my challenge for you today, my encouragement for you today is what does that look like in your life? What are your excuses for not sharing the word? What are your excuses for not praying with somebody? Because let me tell you what, if anybody had a good excuse, it was Jesus. And he didn't make no excuses. Know what he said? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. 
It's finished. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. For without it, we would be lost. We would be a ship without a sail, lost at sea, in the dark, stumbling around, crashing into rocks. But thank you for your son who didn't have to didn't have to go to the cross, Lord. Matter of fact, he even asked you, Father, if there's any other way for this to pass. Lord, this was the only way. Thank you for him. Father, I know that there's maybe some in here today that maybe they've never had a relationship with you and they're wondering how do they, how do they get this freedom? How do they receive this free gift of salvation? Well, if that's you in here today, as people are praying, let me just encourage you. Scripture says, confess with your mouth, but believe in your heart that Jesus is who he says he is, that he did for you what you could never do for yourself. And so for that's you today and, and you're wondering, how do I do this? Listen, I'm going to lead you in this prayer, but it's the belief in your heart that also needs to take place. And so it can be something like this. Dear Jesus, I admit I'm a sinner. I believe what you did on the cross for me so many years ago. I believe you took my place. I believe you took my sin and gave me a new life, bringing forgiveness. Jesus, I confess you as my Lord and Savior today, and I've promised to follow you the rest of my life. Not sit by, Lord, but follow you step for step. And so thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Maybe there's some in here today that have just grown stagnant. They've gone stale and they're wondering, Lord, what are my, what are my next steps? Father, I pray that they're, they have the boldness and the courage, one, to ask you what their next steps are, but to two, come seek us out. Come seek out myself or Pastor Zach or Pastor Corey in the back and Father, help us to take them next steps. Help us to lead them to be fully devoted followers of you. Father, your plan for us isn't to just stay lost. Your plan for us isn't to stay dark. You've called us to be a light on a hill, shining so all can see. And so help us. Help us to shine that light. Help us to get out of our own way and truly live for you. Father, we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Hey, we're about to start this last song. Uh, and as we do, as we start singing, there's gonna be men and women in different corners. If you need prayer, come on up. Don't be scared. Man, we're all struggling with something. Leave it at the cross. Love you.